Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Fall 2018 Honors Lecture Series on Governors. My name is Dr. Philip Phillips, and I'm the Associate Dean of the University Honors College. And on behalf of the Honors College and Dean Vile, I welcome all of you here today, uh, those of you who are in the class, those of you who are visiting us from across campus, and of course, our guests. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite Dr. Mary Evans to make introductions. Dr. Evans is, history, is a history professor here at MTSU, and she's also one of our resident faculty members in the Honors College. Um, she is a huge advocate for voting, voting, voting. She is the director of the American Democracy Project on our campus, and uh, I am greatly indebted to her this semester for helping with this series, not only helping, but indeed organizing uh, the majority of the uh, speakers that we have. So, Dr. Evans. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we have um, two very exceptional and um, wonderful guests. We're very thrilled to have them here uh, in the University Honors College. Um, today is October 29th, and we have the music director from the Nashville Symphony, Maestro Giancarlo Guerrero, who is our primary speaker, and he's being interviewed by MTSU's own Dr. Reed Thomas of the School of Music who is a professor of orchestra and the director of our, many of our local chamber uh, ensembles at the university. Uh, let me give you a brief introduction of both of them. Dr. Reed Thomas has been director of bands and professor of music and conducting in the School of Music here at MTSU since 2003. His responsibilities in con con include conducting the wind ensemble and the university chamber winds, teaching undergraduate courses and graduate courses in wind and orchestra and conducting, and he guides all aspects of the MTSU band program. He's a founding conductor of the Three Rivers Wind Symphony, a professional group of wind and percussion players from northeastern Indiana, and was the conductor of the Littleton Chamber Winds in Littleton, Colorado for a number of years back in the 1990s. He's guest conducted, frankly, all around the world. Um, he's an active conductor and clinician who's received praise and critical acclaim for his interpretive conducting and his groups have been invited to perform uh, in the U.S. and in uh, Asia, um, Central and South America. He's an avid supporter of new music, commissioning over 60 compositions and presenting world premiere performances as well and of multiple compositions around the globe. He's a strong supporter of music in Brazil and Latin America, in Spain and Portugal and China, and he has compact discs featuring the MTSU Wind Ensemble on the Naxos label and the Toccata Classics label, more to be released soon as well. Um, Dr. Thomas is a native of Colorado. He received his PhD in music with an emphasis in conducting from the University of Minnesota and both his master's and bachelor's degrees in music education from the University of Utah. Prior to his appointment at MTSU, he conducted at universities in Indiana and Colorado, and he's written articles um, in many appropriate um, journals for musicians. Um, he is the artistic director of a music festival in Costa Rica, and he's an active member of several associations of music directors and band directors across the country and indeed the globe. So we thank so much um, Dr. Thomas from stepping over from the School of Music side of campus to our side of campus to be our interlocutor today and to sort of provide the, Q and the questions for uh, Maestro Giancarlo Guerrero. Uh, who is our, our featured speaker and guest today. He's a six-time Grammy award-winning conductor, now in his 10th season as music director of the Nashville Symphony, holding the Martha and Bronson Ingram Music Director Chair. Mr. Guerrero is also a music director of the Wrocław Philharmonic in Poland and principal guest conductor in the Gulbenkian Orchestra in Lisbon, Portugal. Um, he's praised for his instinctive musicianship and for bringing to the podium vitality and insight and his also appealing um, dynamism from the conductor's stage. He's a passionate proponent of new music. Mr. Guerrero has been championed, uh, has championed the works of m many of America's most respected composers through commissions, recordings, and world premieres and his advocacy has helped make Nashville a destination for contemporary orchestral music. He's presented nine world premieres with the Nashville Symphony, 
Grammy Award winning recordings, a, 19, a 2018 premiere and recording of Leshenoff Symphony No. 4, written for the Nashville Symphony's Violins of Hope initiative, which you may have heard about, which featured a collection of restored instruments that survived the Holocaust. And that will be released by Naxos in the spring of 2019. And as part of his commitment to fostering contemporary music, Mr. Guerrero developed and guided the creation of Nashville Symphony's Composer Lab and Workshop Initiative. Um, fall of 2018 premiere of The Requiem, John Harbison's monumental work with the Nashville Symphony. Um, and that was, will be available shortly, I think. The release marks his first choral recording and first commercially available release of a work that had pr been premiered with Boston Symphony back in 2003. So there is a rich discography with the Nashville Symphony um, during the era of Mr. Guerrero, and that number is about to be up to number 17. Outside of the United States, Poland and Portugal, Mr. Guerrero enjoys relationships with orchestras really around the world. He's recently back from Europe and is headed there again later this week. His 2018-2019 engagements include performances in Dallas, Chicago, Germany, Brazil, and Spain. He's appeared with prominent North American orchestras including Baltimore, Boston, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Dallas, Detroit, you name it, he's been there and conducted. Um, he's developed a strong international desk con guest conducting profile as well, literally all around the world. Dear, early in his career, he worked regularly with the Costa Rican Lyric Opera, and he's conducted new productions there, also in Australia. Um, his list of accomplishments is incredibly lengthy and very um, impressive. Mr. Guerrero was born in Nicaragua. He immigrated during his childhood to Costa Rica. Uh, where he joined the local youth symphony. And he quickly proved to be a promising percussionist. He came to the United States to study percussion. He conducted uh, and, and conducting at Baylor University in Texas and at Northwestern. And given his beginnings in civic youth orchestras, Mr. Guerrero is particularly engaged with conducting, training, and working with young people um, at youth orchestras also around the country and the globe, and as well also in Nashville. Um, with his interest in youth and teaching, um, he is here with us today to um, edify and teach us. Um, and he's going to speak about music director as governor of the orchestra. I said the floor and pass the baton to Dr. Reed Thomas. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Thank you. So maestro. As this is a forum for talking about governing, most of the time we think about governors, and in this election year, uh, that's most people think about governors as the governor. But uh, uh, will you speak to us a little bit about your role as the music director, <laughs> which is a, is a title that I don't think most people really, uh, everyone associates you as the conductor, which is obviously a big part of what you do, but your official title is the music director of the Nashville Symphony, am I correct? That is correct, and actually, uh, in the United States, uh, you have two titles. I am music director and conductor. The conductor part you see when I'm on the podium, and when you see it on stage, I get to wave the stick, and, uh, and uh, that's the conductor part. But the music director part, I think, is the, the more important and also the more difficult. That's the one that I was not taught how to do. I've had, I had to learn it um, on the fly, because being the music director in a major city of a, one, of, one of the most important orchestras in the country and probably also around the world, sometimes you equate that as almost being a mayor of a city because you really have such a direct impact into the idea that you can really guide a, an entire community's uh, taste in music, particularly in classical music. But if you were to check the website of the orchestra, classical music is only a portion of what we do. See, this is not your grandfather's symphony, and it should not be. And if we did that, then we would be dinosaurs, and, and yeah, we should deserve to die. But symphonies have to continue evolving. We have to continue ways to making it relevant in the 21st century. And that is the one thing, I think, of being music director that keeps me up at night. That is the stuff that, how do I keep something so vital? And in many cases, music that has been written 200 years ago, or 300 years ago in some cases, how do I make it speak to you? How do I make sure that you understand that just the same way that a Picasso painting or a Van Gogh painting can have uh, uh, an impact on you, so does the music of Beethoven and Mozart. And that requires a, a great degree of, of going out in forums like this and making a case for it, but at the same time creating the necessary environments 
uh, within the concert hall, the Skammerhorn Symphony Center, which, by the way, is one of the greatest concert halls on the face of this earth. And if you've never experienced it, you do not know what you're missing. Everywhere I go now is a step down for me. It is. I'm not kidding you. He's not kidding. I am not kidding you. In terms of the acoustic marvel, it's a place that is so appropriate for a city that prides itself in calling Music City. But it is a, it is a double-edged sword because there is so much musical offering and great musical offering of the greatest imaginable genre level. Uh, how do I make the symphony you know, be as vital as the Ryman or the Grand Ole Opry? And uh, for me, one of the greatest joys of living in the city now for 10 years is the fact that I've gotten to know some of the greatest musicians across so many genres who inspire me and make me want to practice just a little bit more. Uh, and I'm always looking for excuses to collaborate with them and share the stage with them. And uh, so in the end, yeah, the music director aspect of it is just the whole planning and, and making sure that I become a spokesperson for the symphony beyond just what you think, you know, Beethoven, Mozart, Brahms. It's not. It should be beyond that, and music should have a uh, big representation in this day and age. So as, as part of that, with your governing philosophy, you, you um, are responsible for helping get all of the these ideas out to, to people. And I know you do a lot of, of uh, I, I think it's fantastic, the, the, the amount of uh, commissions that you've done, because mm -hmm. uh, that's really not traditionally been a role of a lot of, well, uh, the reason, more, more recently. Well, here's the deal, um, and, and I find this interesting. I go guest conduct, and you know, as a guest conductor, the best way that I can describe guest conducting is like you're dating. You go on at a date and you have a wonderful time with the Boston Symphony and you play some great concerts. And you know what? If I don't call you on Monday, it's fine. You know? And, and we're going to miss each other. And then three, four years later, you know what? We might go out again. And some orchestras, I have a very nice kind of long-term girlfriend-boyfriend relationship uh, for 20 years. I would never want to marry them. I'm very happy being a guest conductor. And they're very happy having me as a guest conductor as well. Trust me. It's a two-way street. Uh, and every now and then you do find that one ensemble that chemistry-wise and, and, and institutionally in the city and so many things come in and you say, you know what, I would want to be a deeper part. I want to be involved with this orchestra and, and guide the future of this institution. Um, and I love it when I go to orchestras and, and I, for example, as you say, I propose new music. And the reason why I like new music, and um, for some reason when you say new music or new art, is some sort of a bad word. You know, people freak out. And I don't blame you. You know, some, some of our artists in the 20th century went a little too cuckoo. You know, I don't blame you. But uh, in the end, it's, it's not a bad thing to push the envelope. Come on, Beethoven pushed the envelope too far. And even during his time, he was considered way too revolutionary. I mean, that's nothing new. It's just a, a, it's a, it's a knee-jerk reaction. Uh, but I love when I go to Boston Symphony, for example, and they say, oh, no, no, but let's just keep it, you know, friendly. Beethoven, Brahms, Sch Schumann. Uh, because we're a very conservative audience. And I say, well, but that's your fault. I mean, who controls the programming? You do, not the audience. It is up to you to educate and make the audience more sophisticated. So the fact that you're just giving the, the audience just cheesecake every day, they're going to get tired of it. Listen, I love cheesecake, but if that's all they give me, eventually I will get tired. And that's when I think when I see programming that just reflects 250 years ago. So what have you done for me lately? Why haven't you writing stuff that, that I can connect with? Uh, you also have to remember that old music was new. Mozart, he had world premieres. Beethoven had world premieres. We forget that. Um, and guess what? Most of those were very unsuccessful. The fact that we have this music available to us 250 years later against all odds either horrible performance or remember we didn't have computers so the composer had to sit down and write every single note with those horrible ink inkwell pens and you're going is that an f sharp or an f natural who cares and the guy is still beethoven he's still writing the music as the the pool, the pool musicians are trying to put it together it's a famous story of beethoven playing one of his piano concertos he copied all the parts all the violin parts and the cello part and the clarinet part but he didn't have time to copy the actual piano part you know what because he had memorized it but you know what? He still needed somebody to turn pages. So the guy who had the most difficult job on that day was the poor kid who was 18 years old, who was asked, you need to turn pages for Mr. Beethoven, who was going deaf by the time. By that point, he was going completely deaf and had become so paranoid that he was just a horribly grumpy, smelly man. 
He was smelly, by the way. He didn't, he, was, he didn't practice good hygiene. That's one of the realities about Beethoven. If you go to Vienna right now, you're going to run into 500 Beethoven houses. Anywhere that Beethoven spent a night there, they call them Beethoven houses. And you know why there's about 500 of them? Because he was a horrible tenant. These, these were real men. These were real people. We put them on this pedestal. Yes, were they were, were there probably bigger genius than most of us? Yes. But at the same time, they were tormented. And they, were, they, they, they had issues like the rest of us. And you hear their music. So going back to what I was saying is uh, all music was new. And you have to, you have to make sure that, that you never lose evolving. Music is a living form, a living organism, just like, like art is, like painting, like literature. It's a living organism. The things that inspired it, love, hatred, optimism, war, uh, are the same things that have been around for as long as humans have been around. So that I think is what people should connect with. I also love new music because I'm a curious person. You know, I, on my car, if you go to my car, you're going to hear Led Zeppelin and you're going to hear Rush and Nickelback and, uh, you know, Alejandro Sanz and whatever I can get my hands on. Usually my kids control the music, but I, I'm just curious by nature. And also I used to be a percussionist. I came from the back of the orchestra with two sticks, I'm in the front with one. And percussionist, all everything we've done is from the 20th century. So maybe I'm kind of geared towards it. Uh, but I don't do it because it's some sort of trick or I'm trying to bring attention. No, I do it because it is my duty to expand the repertoire. It is my duty to make sure that the composers that we celebrate now in 50 years are going to be the next Beethoven's, Mozart's, and Brahms. But we've got to give them a voice. And why wait until they're dead? I mean, what a shame that we come to appreciate people after they're long gone. You know, if I was, I would want to have make, I'd give the orchestra as a, as a wonderful vehicle to make these composers come to life and, and celebrate them while we have them. And I'll give you the best example of what I believe is, 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 is the reason why I do this. Imagine for one second that you were alive in 1808 and you're, you're in Vienna and you're walking down the street, you're coming from the grocery store and you see a poster on December 23rd of 1808. There's a poster on the corner that says that there's a concert that night that some guy named Beethoven is premiering uh, a piano concerto, two symphonies uh, and a choral piece. And guess what? Before the concert, he's giving a pre-concert lecture. Knowing everything you know now, would you miss that? I'll give you another example. You're walking in Paris in the 1920s, and some guy named Picasso is going to give a lecture on his paintings. Knowing everything you know now, if you were there, would you even dare to miss that? You know? It's exactly the same thing. So you have to, you have to value these things. This is what makes us who we are. So, very important. I think that's, I think that's uh, remarkable. Uh, in my line of work, I bring in uh, guest composers all the time. And not maybe for the same reasons, but they're definitely the reasons that were there. But one of the, the great things about bringing in composers is that, and, and I'm talking to my students all the time, we are living in the golden age of this right now, where you can have a composer and you can call them up on the phone and say, hey, how do I do this? What do you mean by this? And I'll never forget when I was a grad student and my mentor said, I was doing this, you know, highfalutin analysis of this piece. And they said, and, and he said, and the, he was still alive. And, he's, and I, I, I can't find much information from him, you know. He's not in groves. And, and uh, he said, call him. I about had a heart attack. I was like... You know, because these are people that are, but, you know, I called him up and I was expecting to be just kind of, you know, three hours later, I'm still talking on the phone because they're people just like we are, but they also, they work alone for the most part. Well, so, conductors, conductors also, we're a very lonely bunch too. Yes, we are. Yeah. You know, it's us and the stick and composers with their pencils or their piano. I mean, it's, it's. You know, but I've, at least I'm sure you've found this as well. I mean, with composers or with great artists, the one thing that they have in common, they are the most generous and the nicest Absolutely. people you're ever going to find. Yeah. And I've always said, no, they are great, amazing people who happen to be great artists. It's not the other way around. It's not that they're great artists who are, no. They're first and foremost incredibly down-to-earth, uh, generous, uh, loving people 
that happen to play the piano great or the violin or you know or the banjo you know but uh, what drives him is the, the, this idea of of just sharing and and paying it forward what has that been like to work with Bella oh man listen just the fact that I get to call him a friend I mean he, listen Bella is he's, he's from another planet and I think the same about Yo-Yo Ma or Chuck Perlman I think exactly the same about them I mean I, I, I see them do what they do and they do it with such with such dedication and but at the same time I, I, I go teach and I and, and I'm not a uh, even though maestro means teacher I don't teach I don't I'm, I don't I'm not affiliated with a school or university because in reality I don't know how you guys do it I don't know how to teach this I don't Neither and, do and, I well but you know what but you know I've seen I've seen I've seen the people who've dedicated their lives to to passing on this because for me it's floor window window ceiling that's all I know by the way, I, I just gave you 95% of what we do. <laughs> floor, window, window, ceiling. Sometimes one window, floor, window, ceiling, floor, window, ceiling. Sometimes no windows, floor, ceiling, floor, ceiling, floor, <laughs> ceiling. There's the other 3%. <laughs> and, oh, and then times floor, 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 floor. <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'm giving you the secrets. Conducting, it's, there's, there's nothing really to it in the sense of the technical. There's a much deeper aspect of, of, of how you transmit and inspire 150, 30, 20 players in front of you. I mean, that's, that's where the magic is. And conducting, by the way, is the only proof we have that telepathy exists. It is. I mean, it is true. I'm not, I'm not kidding. I'm not making, it is the only tangible proof that telepathy does exist. I can get in front of any orchestra anywhere in the world and just get up there with just not ever saying anything with a stick in my eyes, and I can have wonderful conversations with them. And you know what my, my most powerful weapon is? My eyebrows. Have you noticed that your most expressive thing you have in your is your eyebrows? My kids know my looks very well. They particularly know this one. Can you believe how powerful just doing this is? Or this? You have to know how to use it, you know? Or my favorite. That's all you need to do. And musicians either will, will respond or will hate you for it. But that's the whole point. Um, but yeah, I mean, this whole idea of, of, of you know, uh, 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 of working with these incredible artists and watching them, the one thing I always tell these students is, you know it's not an accident. They practice their butts off. I've seen it firsthand. It's, I mean, they have the talent. But man, they work with the dedication and discipline that, you know, I remember Yo-Yo said to me, hey man, I have a reputation now. I mean, I gotta work harder. I mean, I'm working harder now than I ever did. You know who Doc Severinsen is, right? Many of you, maybe he's, okay. Doc Severinsen is, is 94 now. He still wears le leather pants, by the way. He's the only 90 year old I know that wears leather pants and wears them perfectly. And he can still play. A, a colleague of mine who's a trumpet player said, um, you know, I said, how impressive it is to watch this man? I mean, something that requires such physical, you know, and he's like, man, I hope I can feed myself, let alone, you know, play the trumpet like that. And uh, Doc was the principal pops conductor in the Minnesota Orchestra. I was with the Minnesota Orchestra for five years as associate conductor, which means I'm the just-in-case guy. That's really what it is. Associate conductor is, uh, the conductor has bad sushi, I'm on. Uh, and uh, so... Doc was the pops guy, and, uh, and I worked with him a lot. And Doc was not really a conductor, and he knew it. But he got up there, and uh, we did all these shows called Jingle Bell Doc. And, I mean, it was great pop stuff, and, and he's a fantastic uh, master of ceremonies. But play the trumpet, and every now and then he would get up there, and we would play the trumpet and try to conduct from the trumpet. And many times it didn't go well. <laughs> because, I mean, it's one rehearsal, and, and Doc is trying. I mean, you're trying to lead. No, I mean, you need somebody. So he'll call me, and I'll get up on the podium, and I'll conduct. And I'll never forget, it was Carnival of Venice, which is, if you're a trumpet player, that's like, you know, the most famous trumpet piece on the face of this universe. One rehearsal, we were playing, and we had agreed that after we were going to go to our favorite Mexican restaurant. So I'm actually looking forward to the meal afterwards, not the concert. The concert is the excuse. And uh, we get to the rehearsal, and uh, it's not perfect. He's missing a few notes here and there, you know, but come on, it's Doc. He's played the piece a million times. You know, so we finished the rehearsal, and I say, okay, man, let's go. I'm ready for fajitas. And he looks at me, he's like, are you out of your mind? Didn't you hear the rehearsal? I sounded awful. I'm like, what? You just missed a couple of notes. Like, no, man, it was awful. No, no, you go, man. I, I got to stay here. I got to practice. It's like, but you're Doc. It's like, yes, that's why. 
So he asked the, person, the, the stage manager, he said, uh, is, is, the, is, the, is the stage uh, busy? He's like, nope, not until the concert, you, you can have it. So he grabbed a chair and put out his little trumpet case and took out his little metronome, cranked it up, took out a couple of trumpet books and started playing this. And for the next three hours, that's all he did. He played scales, arpeggios. I don't have to tell you how he played that night. It's not an accident. It's not just talent. I mean, these guys work like you would not believe. He said, I'm doing everything in my power to teach my lips that perfection is impossible. Don't even go there. You're never going to be perfect. Nobody's perfect. Eight out of ten, I will nail it. Not a bad ratio. And you know what? It works not only in music. It works in everything. I found anything that you invest in whatever it is that you love, I promise you, you will get it all back. I swear to you. Anything that you invest into whatever it is that you decide to dedicate your life to, any sacrifice, any, anything that you just go without for the pursuit of your dream, I swear to you, you will get it all back. It's not an accident. But you have to be brutally honest with yourself. Don't lie to yourself. I see a lot of that. You know, lying to yourself is the perfect road to mediocrity. Don't. Be brutally honest with yourself and always maintain and push your standards to a way that, you know, um, that you will achieve what you want. So, so can you, going back to your uh, uh, music director role, um, can you talk to us about how, what the, what the, uh, your, I guess I'll, since we're on this topic, your mm -hmm. governing style and yeah, your, your about choosing a season and within that season even a concert? Well, that's, for me, that's the most exciting and frustrating part of the job because when I decide or I want to put a program together, first of, first of all, I have limited weeks uh, and I have limited dates uh, to put things together and it has to make sense. It cannot be just heavily, you know, geared to one style of music or heavily towards one type of soloist. I need to have my fair amount of pianists, violinists, banjo players, spoon players, dancers, whatever, to make sense of a season. And because I have an orchestra that can basically play anything under the, the, the sun, I basically have no, no constraints artistically. So I start with everything that I, is my wish list, but then reality sinks in. Financial, scheduling, marketing. I do have to sell tickets. I gain nothing by putting all these great programs that look so great on paper, you know, and they are so beautiful, like some mad scientist put them, and then nobody shows up. I gain nothing for that. I want to put programs together that gives people the feeling that this is for them. That, you know what, when I put this one program this week, you know what, you feel, that was for me. That's my program. They, that guy was thinking about me. So in terms of governing, because I am the artistic director, I have to get all the constituencies of the symphony kind of bought into it. I have a lot of unofficial focus groups, friends, board members, subscribers, musicians in the orchestra that I throw ideas at. I run into them in the hallways and I say, you know what, what do you think of this? Okay, that's all I need to know. Or I go to a board member. I say, you know what, I'm trying to push this thing and could I have your support though so when this is get brought up? Remember, I, the board of directors role is to maintain the um, it's a non-profit organization. We depend on the generosity of people. We get no funds from the government. It's completely privately uh, done by the generosity of people, people who give as little as $5 to people who give six figures. And why do they do it? Are we the only worthy cause in Nashville? Of course not. There's many other great, amazing, worthy causes, including MTSU, institutions that need and deserve uh, the, 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 the support of, of our citizens in our community. So my job is to make them feel a sense of ownership, that the symphony somehow speaks to their own interest. So when putting a season together is not just what I like. I mean, how boring would my life be if I say, I just put Beethoven 5 because I like it. I mean, that's not a good enough reason. There has to be something deeper. So how is this going to affect Nashville? And by the way, what works in Nashville 
doesn't work in Berlin. It shouldn't. What works in New York doesn't work in Paris. I mean, every city and what's happening here in Middle Tennessee nowadays, I think, is quite exciting. When you look at the amount of growth, a little scary, actually. I mean, for those of us who are right downtown, I'm in the vortex of hell. <laughs> I am because it's the Demumbrium, 3rd and 4th Avenue. I'm there. I park. My loading dock is there. Coming out of a concert there, I call it the vortex of hell. And no amount of police can solve that. And uh, I hope that at some point before I am done with my tenure here, that will be fixed. But you know what? I have to take that into consideration when I program, because Nashville is not what it was two years ago. Nashville is not what it was 10 years ago, and I promise it's not going to be the same a year from now. So how do I stay ahead of, of the pack? That is why the constituency of donors, marketing, uh, orchestra members, uh, board members, etc., they are basically the community. So they are telling me what I need to do, and at the same time, I try to tailor-make it. So conducting is by far the easy part of my job. By far. I'm sure you feel the same way. Absolutely. By far. I mean, I get up there, and I'm happy. And it's, the way, and it's what I do the least. The rest, 20, 22 hours of the rest of my day, I'm basically dreaming and thinking. Uh, I'm lucky here because... Uh, in, in the way that the orchestra is run, in the, in, 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 in the uh, administrative tree that is the orchestra, I am the artistic director, but there is also an administrative director, a CEO. And he's in charge of the administration to make sure that we have the funds necessary to make sure that the artistic is taken care of. And we both report directly to the board. So Alan Valentine, who's the CEO, who is a genius, He's the greatest orchestra manager that I've ever seen. The hall was built during his time. So he's got an amazing, you know, so what have you done? There, that. I did that. He managed to get the community and rally behind it, along with some very, very important citizens in this community that with their generosity felt um, they needed to give back. Old school philanthropy, which is getting lost. Remember, the turn of the centuries, the Carnegies, the Vanderbilts. I mean, these people still were... I'm afraid that, that there's a, a, the, the idea of philanthropy is getting lost on the new generation of, of wealth. You know, it's an older thing. I talk to some of our older donors, they cannot imagine it not doing it. People who you grew up in the Depression and the World Wars, et cetera. Um, in many ways, I'm, I, I'm afraid that this newer generation in the last 50 years, things have been so good that they don't think that there's a need. And it's unfortunate that we only react after you know, catastrophic events. So we are beneficiaries of that. And uh, the CEO and I have an incredibly great relationship. We disagree 90% of the times, which is great. But we disagree in private. And we disagree completely with each other. We actually go out of town uh, to meet and yell and scream at each other. But at the end of the day, I look at him and say, you know what, but that's your department. And if that's how we're going to do it, I will support you 500%. You know, I will try to make my case, but yet, you know what? That kind of falls under your jurisdiction. So if it blows up, it's your fault. <laughs> um, and there's a great level of respect and admiration. And at the same time, you know, but I, I promise you, I mean, a lot of the, our disagreements can get quite heated. But we both understand that we want the same things. We want a fabulous world-class orchestra. And we have done that. And uh, we are very proud of that. So when you, I mean, it sounds like your, your decision-making style, your governing style is kind of, uh, you rely on a lot of people to help you make of those course. decisions. But how does it come, when does the buck actually stop? No, there, no, okay. Um, I can make all the research that I can, you know. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, when we appoint a musician, when there's an opening in the National Symphony, let's say the violinist retires and we have one violin opening, we get 300 players from all over the world. And we are, we are obligated to listen to all of them. By, by rule, the orchestra is a union organization. We are obligated to listen to every single person that comes in to audition. We have to listen to them. And uh, so the audition process usually takes two or three days. So 300 to, 300 to 250, 300 violinists from all over the world. They pay their own expense. And basically, we make them play the most difficult music ever written for the violin. That's basically what we make them do. And the audition process is behind the screen. There is a committee of myself and musicians of the orchestra, nine of us, 
And uh, we even put carpet on the, on the stage. So when the person walks in, we don't hear nothing. I mean, it's completely, the only thing we hear from behind the screen is the person playing. There's a, uh, and so we're the committee and we listen and uh, usually in the first round, we get rid of them in the, in the first 10 seconds. Yeah. If I have 300 violinists, don't waste my time. <laughs> Thank you. It's very brutal. And I know many of these people, some of them even probably mortgaged their home to come to this audition for a 10 second crash and burn. But there's no other way, there's no other fair way. I cannot appoint somebody, neither can the musicians. We can only appoint somebody that is up to the musical standards. We don't know where they come from, we don't know who they studied with, we don't know whether they are African American, Chinese, Korean, Costa Rican, Nicaraguan, female, male, trans, we don't know anything. We're just guiding ourselves by uh, what we hear. And, uh, and then we get to the finals, I come in in the finals, and what you were asking, there is a committee, but the final decision rests in the hands of the music director. So I go around, so what did you think? So we have in the end two finalists, three finalists. And if you, get, if you make it that far, after 300 violinists, you know what, if you're one of the top three, you've proven you can play. No question. The question is, you have the stamina, three days in, to keep, and it's, it's actually heartbreaking to get to that finals and watch that last guy or last girl crash and burn. And who's left standing? And when you do that, sometimes the committee's, the, 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 the decision is easy. We have three people, two crash and one was remaining standing. And everybody's like, number 89. <laughs> and by the way, we never start with number one. The personal manager, when they ask, the, 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 each candidate gets assigned a number. That's all we, we don't got resumes, nothing. So every candidate arrives and they get, so the first number, uh, they start, uh, the, the personal manager, uh, the, every, every audition that we make, she starts with a different number. So the first candidate may be candidate number 26. And from then up. Nobody wants to be number one. This is candidate number one. That's kind of, I mean, you're, no. You know, so that person, that person themselves don't know if they're the first one. I mean, somebody might have played behind, they don't know. And there's an entire ballet backstage of proctors and, uh, and uh, volunteers, board members sometimes, and some very nice ladies, old ladies who come, and basically their job is to keep these people behind the closed door, and they're guarding them like they were a, 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 an army officer. <laughs> and when they're ready, they literally grab them and make sure that there's no contact between them and anybody who has any decision making. It's to keep the, 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 everybody who's gone into the National Symphony and any orchestra in the United States, that's the process. It's completely fair. And uh, so in the end, um, if I have two players and they're both fantastic, okay, you play. <laughs> you play. <laughs> okay, now you play. Play it a little bit faster. <laughs> okay, now you play it a little bit faster. And it just becomes this, this duel. And we're looking at each other like, who? I mean, and that's when you get into the whole, well, but this one has a little bit more elegance. This one has a little bit better left hand. Nonsense. We literally start splitting hairs. Well, this one, you know, I, the bow seems a little heavy. You can tell that. You know, the vibrato seems, you know. Uh, the, the Tchaikovsky was just a little too romantic. Well, I, I like my Tchaikovsky romantic. You know, well, I don't. I like it a little bit more subdued. You know, we all have opinions, especially when it comes to art. And here's the best part, there's no wrong answer. As long as you're dedicated and committed, there's no wrong answer. It's what you like. Listen, how boring if we all like, listen, there are pieces of Beethoven that put me to sleep. Does that make me a bad person? No. I'm proud to tell you. I mean, there, there, there are paintings that I look, you know, red dot and summer of 1944. I'm like, my God, my daughter could have done that. I mean, I will tell you that, but that's who I am. So going back to what you said, we have the committee, and then at some point we will discuss ad nauseum, but at some point you have to make a decision. And that's when I will listen to everybody, and I'll say, thank you very much. I'm going with number 85. Thank you. And that's it. I want everybody to make feel that they had a voice. I want to make sure that everybody felt that they said what they had to say. Um, and I've had actually a couple of committee members have stormed off, angry. Oh, the nerve. 
consensus to me is important. You know why? Because this person, when they join the orchestra, they're not just going to work with the committee next to them. And I want also this person to make sure that, that they're going to have their back. And they're not going to make their life miserable just because they disagreed with it. So in any organization, trying to maintain a certain degree of, 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 of uh, peace is absolutely imperative. There used to be a time that conductors were tyrants and you know they ruled with an iron fist. I'm thankful I don't live in those days. I'm not that person. I'm not. I came from Nicaragua. I grew up under a tyrant. My family, we had, when we were 12, we lost everything. I came out of Nicaragua wearing the clothes that I had on. So maybe that affected me that I don't, I don't, I don't like that idea of, of absolute power. And besides, power doesn't come from yelling and screaming and getting your way. When I have so many 100 musicians in the National Symphony, all fabulous world-class players, I would be completely stupid if I didn't use that as a resource which I do every day. My Rolodex, well, there's no Rolodex. My iPhone is filled with contacts. If I have a question about library issues, a question about violin issues, a question about clarinet issues, I ask the expert. I don't guess. I, I don't even dare to guess. My job is too important. So I ask the people who can educate me and instruct me, and every day I grow. So for me, power comes from knowledge. The knowledge to do the right thing and the knowledge to know, really understand what you're doing. And the best part of it, when I conducted Beethoven five, three years ago, now I conduct it again, it's not the same. You know why? Because I'm not the same person. And I cannot wait to, when I'm 90 years old, if, if I get that many years, to see when I look at these pieces again and see them hopefully like they're brand new. So that is what I look forward to. Excellent. So uh, they've asked us to open up the floor for questions. So if we have questions, we can, the floor is yours. Don't be shy. Yes. Uh, thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Um, so this, forgive me, this might be an ignorant question. Um, never, never, never an ignorant question. Could you describe what, it would, what would happen if there wasn't a conductor? Like, mm -hmm. like if the orchestra, what would the product be? Excellent question. How many of you go to concerts regularly? Have you, how many of you have seen you know, what a conductor does? Do you really know what a conductor does? No. I mean, I mean, I mean, do you really understand? I mean, unless you're a musician, if you've played in an orchestra, you might have an idea, and I promise you, it's not complete. So it's actually an excellent question. Um, let me give you an example. Um, if you come to conduct the Chicago Symphony, which is one of the great orchestras of the Berlin Philharmonic, they've played the Beethoven Five a gazillion, trillion, million, billion times with every imaginable conductor and they've recorded it, so they know the piece. You know the piece. ba 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 you know the piece. First of all, what, what type of a melody is that? I mean, Beethoven was not a gifted melodist. That's the perfect proof. He was not. Mozart, Haydn, they had melodies coming out of every pore. Beethoven, da 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 da. Da 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 da. He built an entire symphony on da 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 da. The four most famous notes in the universe. Listen, that was Beethoven's genius, the development of motifs. He grabbed that motif and turned it upside down in so many magical ways that you're stuck. But do you go around whistling? <laughs> you, you, I mean, who does that? That's Beethoven. And then you get into the whole thing of, okay, he was going deaf, the idea of fate knocking at the door. Then the piece all of a sudden, okay, there's something very deep here. A man that is realizing that this is going away from him, the, the most respected composer of his day embarrassingly having to grab a horn and say, can you speak louder because I cannot hear you? Can you imagine the humiliation? It's in the DNA. It's not ta-ta-ta-ta, it's a door knocking fate. This is getting away from you and there's nothing you can do about it. You go to the Berlin Philharmonic, they played it a million times, but they played it with 50 conductors. And they come in and they say, oh, we've done it. Ah, oh, we know it. They don't. Because you remember it different than, he, than she remembers it. And you remember it different than he remembers it because we all bring baggage. It's much easier when they've never played it. But to get a cohesive performance of a piece that, okay, so how violent do you want it? How loud do you want that opening? How romantic do you want it? Do you, how much time do you take in the fermatas? 
So my job as a conductor, especially in many cases, when you do a piece that is so well known, those are the worst because everybody brings baggage. It's like when you read a book, you know the ending, and they say, well, so what are you going to tell me that I don't know about this? So my job is to technically bring ideas that I might say, you know what, I don't want you to play this if you're a violin player. I don't want you to play this in the middle of the ball. I want you to play it on the frog, all of you. And some of them are like, we've never done it like that. I don't care. And you have to convince them that your way is the right way. Remember, you're dealing with 100 prima donnas. They don't call them prima donnas for nothing. You know the phrasing, it's not over until the fat lady sings? It's real. You know, so you do that by inspiring, putting a little fear. Uh, orchestras of that caliber, when you say, what would happen if there was no conductor? They would probably get from A to B together, but they would get there in, in, by different roads. You would get a very kind of mishmash of a performance. The most magical performances I hear are the ones that you see, even sometimes that you see the orchestra kind of uncomfortable, but they've been so seduced by the conductor that they even go against their own, against their own uh, DNA. Uh, Adolf Herseth, who was the first trumpet in the Chicago Symphony, and I saw him play. This guy was, is the god of trumpet players in the Chicago Symphony. 52 years, principal trumpet of that orchestra. And I asked him, I said, of all the conductors, who was your favorite? And he said, Bernstein. He didn't even hesitate, Leonard Bernstein. Oh, and you work with him often? No, once. I, I, I also, I will tell you, I will brag, I met Bernstein. I, I played with him, I, I met with him, I, I, I got a chance uh, to, to spend time with him. This was a man, go YouTube him. This man would get on the podium, and it was just such a, <laughs> the joy of music just came out of every ounce of his body. And Bud said, I love Bernstein. He said, I would be playing my trumpet, and I would say, I want to I, I wanna feel what he's feeling. Um, and, uh, and he would say that, you know, Leonard Bernstein would, conduct and would stop. He, he was back in the days, you know, he died in, in 1989, so he would be smoking the whole time in rehearsals, yeah, and drinking. <laughs> Lenny in rehearsals was this. <laughs> and he conducted like this, by the way. And we understood him. <laughs> Again, I also played with Copeland, Aaron Copeland. He tried to conduct, not very good. With Copeland, though, he would stop and open his mouth, and he's like, okay, the voice of God. But then he would try to, like, communicate this into here. No, it was so, it, was, it didn't work. But Bernstein, it was this. And just by his sheer joy of music that he exuded, we, like, like Bud said, we would jump a cliff for this guy without even questioning it. He had that ability to lead, which is what a conductor does. Um, some pieces, uh, Rite of Spring, to bring a few, or Petrushka, I mean, which are complicated ensemble, without a conductor... I mean, you would get a train wreck. But if it's a piece with like a smaller Mozart symphony with 30 players, and there are groups like the Orpheus Chamber group in, uh, in New York that actually their, their spiel is they don't have a conductor. But I've seen their rehearsals. They're very chaotic because you have 45 opinions. And that can make for a very, for a process that is not very, stream, is not streamed very well. And uh, it's, I think, better when, like you said, I mean, where does the box up? Well, it's nice to the musicians look up, okay, come your ideas. And all great orchestras, even though sometimes don't like to do different things, any orchestra will always tell you, the good orchestras, it's better to have bad ideas than no ideas. You know, always. So when you have an orchestra that is like the Cleveland Orchestra or Berlin, listen, you stand up there, and they're going to play great. And you're going to look fantastic. You're going to be posing for your CD. And they're going to play great. But they're going to sit there going like, so, but tell me how you want it. I mean, and if there's nothing you're telling me, then I'll go into my, and it's going to be a boring or non-consequential performance. So conductors can really make an impact or none sometimes, depending on the, on, on, the, on, on, the, on the performance. But I will promise you one thing. There will be those performances that there's something special in the air. And they happen, and it doesn't have to be classical music. Be, I mean, I've been to Rush concerts. I've gone out crying. I'm a Rush fan, I'm sorry. I've seen every tour since Moving Pictures. I am, <laughs> unapologetic. And I've been there, and, and it's been moving to a point that it stays with me all my life. I remember it vividly, I remember the emotions. I don't know what it was. Was it the city? Was it the audience? I don't know, there's some mystery to it, and that's why I go to concerts. If I wanna hear the music the same way, at home with a, with a nice bottle of wine and my cigar and a nice CD, it'll be okay. But I don't wanna hear everything the same way. 
I mean, when I look at a painting, I, I mean, I look at it again in two years, I don't see it the same way. When I read a book the second time, it's not the same way. It shouldn't be. So that's what the, hopefully the adventure is. When you attend these live performances, hopefully there's a sense of adventure. And I'm like, God, I hated that Rachmaninoff second piano concerto. My God, there's something about it that just, you hate things that you love. And usually it's the negative feelings that are the strongest ones. So. Yes, sir. Do you have any routines or rituals when it comes to conducting that allow you to really do your job well? Uh, uh, okay, uh, so I, every piece of music that I program, I need at least four years to learn them, to really learn them. I feel that in order to get in front of the orchestra, I need to know more than all of them combined. So that means really sitting down, like almost with a magnifying glass, note for note, trying to understand why that note is there. And of course, because this stuff is 200 years old and we have editions of editions of editions, there's this one musicology professor in Hungary that discovered, you try to find logic in this, you know, and you may never find it. Uh, so from that respect, the only thing that protects me, my, co my, my coat of armor when I get in front of an ensemble is I better know this music better than everybody. First, uh, I need a nap before a concert. Uh, I am an early morning person. I, I'm up at 5 every morning, 4.30. That's since my kids were born. Don't ask me why. I've tried to get up late. I can't. My body's just so equipped. Like uh, My mind goes, which is great, because by 6 a.m. I'm done with my emails. And then I can focus on myself. It's been fantastic. But then by 8, 30, 9 o'clock, I'm usually in bed. So on concert night, this is way past my bedtime. So I need a nap, and I don't eat before concerts. I ate one time before a concert. Man, I felt so full that, man, I did a, what was I doing? It was Beethoven 6, the pastoral, man, and it sounded, it was so heavy, man. It was like obese Beethoven 6. <laughs> when it, when it, when it should have been, a, it should have been a, a nice, beautiful, lean machine. You know, it was, and I couldn't get it to move. It just kept getting heavier and heavier. And it was me. So musicians were superstitious, like athletes. I can tell you I have colleagues that, that like eat like the same sandwich before. And there is something about the stage fright mm -hmm. yeah. that, that people, and unfortunately I have colleagues that deal with a reality of stage fright. I'm lucky, I don't have it. I do will tell you, I do get the butterfly and I, they're shaking, you just don't see it. Mm -hmm. But I have all my videos of my first conducting class. I have all of them, by the way. My first conducting class in 1987, it was a mandatory conducting class. I was very happy making fun of conductors. <laughs> and the teacher, yeah, I mean, I had to take the class. I wasn't planning on it. And the teacher said, hey, you could be good at this. like, really? And I'm like, yeah. And I look at the video, like, what did he see? I don't see it. I mean, I, I see the video, and I'm like, I don't see it. I told my kids that someday they should put it up on eBay. Uh, and, uh, but that first video is this. I mean, you're conducting your classmates, you know. But I, think I get the butterflies, but nothing, nothing that paralyzes me. Um, for me, I'm, I just get anxious. I get bored backstage. You know, I'm always there. I'm either, I'm either watching Cheers or whatever I can find on Apple TV, you know. And right before it's like, I say, oh my God, there's going to be spiel, speak before the, past my bedtime. <laughs> yes? Um, so, uh, one thing that's always like new music that you're kind of talking about is like film scores. Yes. Um, do you think that kind of has an impact with kind of like bringing like, you know, like classical instrument, instrumental music to um, like everybody? Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, there's what, what more powerful medium than, 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 than film? Right. And I don't know if, if, you, if you guys were lucky enough, but you know, last year our season was opened by John Williams. Yeah. And John Williams, I mean, okay, I'm gonna brag. I have him on my contacts. I had the pleasure of meeting him in Boston and uh, because he's 80, 85 now, 80, 85, 86 now. And he conducts this, this traditional concert, 4th of July at Tanglewood with the Boston Symphony. But because he's getting old, he can only do the second half. So they usually ask a conductor to do the first half. They ask me. So I've never met, so they flew me out there, and, and John wanted to meet with me. So we had breakfast at 7 a.m., had rehearsal, had lunch, had coffee, hung out, smoked a couple of cigars, uh, had a pre, pre thing with donors, then had the concert and a post-concert dinner. I spent the whole day with him. And I mean, this guy is, I mean, this is, for me, he's the most amazing person I've ever met. And uh, every single tune that I hear is associated with an image, which makes it incredibly powerful. I mean, smell is powerful, but, but visual is even more. 
And and I was just talking to him, and he was just telling me all these stories about you know working with Spielberg and all this. And the 40th anniversary of Close Encounters was happening in this weekend that he was here, and we went to the movies together. We went to see it together here, and in, uh, in, in, we went to uh, Green Hills to see it. <coughs> and uh, nobody recognized him. It was kind of, I mean, who, why would John Williams be in Nashville to go see Close Encounters? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, he, and I said, okay, so I said, John, I mean, we, we drove together, and so John, uh, is there anything that I should know to protect you from the paparazzi? He said, oh, no, they, they won't notice me. <laughs> I said, he said, yeah, where are the other John Williams is at the Green Hills, you know, Regal 24 movie watching Close Encounters of the Third Kind? Which, by the way, not many people went to see it. You know, it was the 40th anniversary, and guess what? Before the movie, there was a, uh, a documentary. And, of course, the whole documentary was about John, not about Spielberg. <laughs> the whole documentary, and, you know, the whole documentary, basically, was a 15-minute thing before the movie, was mostly about da da di da da And how John kept telling Spielberg, no, I need seven no's. I cannot do something with five. And Spielberg said, no, you get five. And John, and, then, and John Williams said, no, I will give you seven. <laughs> and this went on for about a year while the movie was being filmed. And then eventually John came up with ba ba pi ba ba And it's unforgettable. And he said, you know what, Spielberg made me a better composer. He forced me, he didn't let me get away with it. He made me a better composer. Uh, I mean, so film music, absolutely, there should be a marriage. Uh, John. Is actually, like a lot of film composers, is actually hoping for some respect on the side of the academic music, which is unfair. I mean, he's, he's, this guy is more, 10 million times more famous than any classical composer you can think of, but yet somehow he hasn't been received on that end, which is unfair. And vice versa. Very few people, I mean, even Gershwin, I mean, George Gershwin, the first great American composer, he was a Broadway guy. He had the temerity to add saxophones to the orchestra. Ooh, the nerve. <laughs> the, listen, he was, he was the, the New York Times critic at the time said, how dare this Broadway composer? And he meant that, despectively, this is the 1920s. This is classical music. Oh! <laughs> Saxophones. Oh! An American in Paris. Car horns. Quack, 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 quack. The percussions, I didn't go to, I didn't go to Juilliard for this. <laughs> Thank God we moved from that. So absolutely, the combination of, of, of multi-genres is absolutely imperative. Absolutely. And it goes to the benefit of all of us, I think. So, yes? Um, I was at one of the concerts where you conducted James Ennis playing the Beethoven violin concert. Two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was spectacular. And I was wondering about the dialogue between the orchestra and the soloist and how you navigate that. Um, Jimmy Ennis, uh, Canadian violinist, that guy is, a, again, one of those. One of those. And Jimmy and I have worked together. A big part of the relationship with the soloist is chemistry. And I've had a lot of arranged marriages where I go guest conduct and they put me together with a pianist and half of the times it's fabulous and half of the times it blows up. And it has nothing to do with, I mean, you can have a great pianist and a great conductor, but if there's no, I mean, just chemistry, it's just not going to work. Uh, Jimmy and I have been working together for 20 years, when back in the day. You know, he actually remembered our first engagement together was in Edmonton, Canada, in January. So it's like, I must have been freezing. Yes, he was. Um, and. Uh, so that is a big part. And because he's, for me, in my book, he's such a logical musician, I have no problem understanding where he's going. Also, the orchestra adores him. So I will tell you that whenever he comes to town, the musicians are playing on the edge of their seats because they love him. And they want to do the best for him, you know. Uh, but at the same time, he gives us a lot back. He gives us a lot of just joy and generosity. Uh, and you know, normally we get just one rehearsal. I mean, that's how good the orchestra is. I mean, in, well, for a normal concert, we get only you know, one or two rehearsals, and that's, that's it. I mean, it's, it's a world-class ensemble, and the musicians are expected to come in ready to play. Just as if you go to a studio, you have 30 minutes to put this together, you know? And if you're able to do that, you'll have a career in it. You know what? Because otherwise, how many people show up at the airport, guitars in hand? Have you noticed that? When you go to Nashville, how many guitars are on the plane? I just arrived on, the, on a plane this morning. There were six. And they're all coming here for the dream. They're all coming here for that dream, and uh, we benefit from that. So it's fabulous. 
yes, sir. Uh, how do you reconcile like your desire to educate the public, like you're talking about the, at the top, mm -hmm. uh, with trying to uh, make that something that will draw people in? Uh, kind of how you were talking about that conflict and collaboration. But how do you do that? With well, a lot of it is is is, is uh, creative combinations. So if I want to do the Beethoven Violin Concerto, which Beethoven, for people who love classical music, is a known quantity, and it will help sell tickets. On that same program, we had Harmony Lair of John Adams, it's a living composer. So by people coming in to hear the Beethoven or being drawn by that, they're going to get the full-blown experience of Harmony Lair. And over 10 years of doing that combination, audiences are giving me, I think, here, because I've been here now 10 years, I think our audiences, the, the people that are committed to the symphony, they're kind of like, you know what, I see where he is, this is going with him. So they're giving a little bit more room than they did at the beginning. I promise you, at the beginning, some of our concerts sold really horribly. And there was always the knee-jerk reaction of the board or the marketing, doesn't work, that's it, let's just go back to Rachmaninoff, Rachmaninoff, Rachmaninoff. Well, no, it takes time. You also have to know, and by the way, when you come to the next concert, come say hello. I mean that. I mean that. Come, come to the concert and just ask the usher, how do I get backstage? And you say, I need to talk to Giancarlo. Listen, come find me. Before or after. Before every one of my concerts, there's a lecture. I give a 30-minute talk, historical talk, about the music, which is open to the public. You know? You want to learn something new? Come in. And by the way, I make the caveat. Just because you go to the lecture and I tell you, and you know everything there is to know about it, that doesn't mean you're going to like it. <laughs> That's a, listen, how many times I've heard that's the normal thing I hear with, with any type of high art. Oh, I don't know much about it. Because I, I don't like it because I don't know much about it. Nonsense. All you need to appreciate music is a pair of ears. If you want to learn something, fine, that's good for you. But that doesn't mean that just because you know it, that when the guy was born and what he died of and who was sleeping with, doesn't make you think that you're going to like the piece. It doesn't. What you react to is a reflection of who you are and how you were brought up and how you were... You know, my wife and I are sitting in, in concerts many times, and we're not, we're not at the same concert. She's having an outer body experience, and I want to cut my veins. <laughs> <laughs> Who's right? And she's looking at me, are you kidding me? And I'm like... And she's like... Is your wife a musician? No! <laughs> but she, she knows more about it, I know, because I, I'm jaded. I mean, I'm a musician, I'm hearing... Oh, no, she's listening as a normal human being. <laughs> and uh, so, listen, come to... And then after the concert, I do a, a post-concert Q&A. Over 10 years, that has made an impact. Over 10 years, people have felt that, you know what, this is more than just going to a concert. This is a, an experience. It should be. And in, in the lectures, if there's a composer, the composer will be there. And at the Q&A, he, he or she will be there. And you'll get a chance to pick their brain, and maybe some of it might start clicking. But this is a muscle. You have to train it. You know, I mean, just because you go to one concert, no, my God, this is a muscle. You have to train your ears the same way that you train your eyes to appreciate art, the same way that you treat your brain to read a great novel. The first time you read it, I mean, you're kind of like, you have to train your body to do these things the same way that you train for a marathon. And I promise you, at the end of this, at the end of the horizon, your life is going to be so much better for it. It's a dangerous time now in, in, in the world. People think in America, in the world, this idea that knowledge somehow is, is, is like we, it's something we should not pursue. And people who are knowledgeable are somehow thought of you know, in negative terms. When the hell did that happen? You know, I, 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 I look, I was watching the, well, we just had this great movie, Neil Armstrong, you know, First Man. And I just, I bought the whole DVD set. I travel a lot, so I, I travel with, well, now we have Netflix, thank God. But we have the, 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 I bought From the Earth to the Moon. HBO did this about 10, 15 years ago. With Tom, Tom Hanks produced it. And it's basically, it's the 12 episodes of the entire race to the moon. In the 19th, the first Gemini uh, project all the way to the Apollos. And watching how the country and everybody, all this inspiration of, of students wanting to become not only astronauts, but physicists and mathematicians and, and, and accountants. I mean, everything about knowledge and the idea that we could do this. And in, a, in, in one generation, the world has been completely turned upside down. And you know why? Because we did it so quickly that they said, so now what? 
it, it's actually quite a bit scary, and, and because of what you're doing here, what your sole purpose is learning, you're at the forefront of this. You are at the forefront of recovering the idea that hum humanity, humanity's only recourse for surviving is going to be knowledge, period. It's a powerful note to end on, yes. and I don't want to end because I think we could all sit here for yeah. another hour. Thank you. <laughs> Maestro. Um, Thank you. Those of you who need to leave, do, and maybe he'll continue to take some questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.